All right, so from config management to infrastructure as code and now CDK, as with all things in cloud native, even our IAC landscape is continuously a moving target. This past year alone saw a seismic shakeup with the changing of the most popular tools licensing, uh, Terraform, to a source available license. Um, this was a catalyst for the forking of the open source Terraform project, Open Tofu. So welcome, Oni, on that respect, uh, which was contributed to the Linux Foundation and soon to the CNCF, um, which and Zero are one of the early and supporting uh, full-time engineers on that project. Uh, but this ecosystem itself has seen its fair share of uh, shifts and changes from on-prem to cloud, serverless, Kubernetes, and everything else. Um, and you can find a lot of interesting data on these trends in the IAC report from Firefly. You should check it out. Um, and there are myriad tools, languages, methods for deploying technologies. And so that is why I have invited this esteemed panel uh, of experts uh, to help us unpack all this. Um, how all of these IAC changes have impacted our workloads, our cloud native operations directly. Uh, we'll explore and pontificate a little bit uh, on what's coming next in the world of IAC, cloud native ecosystem, where this meets CICD, the worlds of uh, Solomon, and even incident management and things like that. Um, and uh, where new developments are coming into play, open source trials and tribulations, challenges we still need to overcome. Um, and you are most welcome to grill our panelists. That's what they're here for. So uh, don't be ashamed to ask your own questions. We'd love to have audience participation and have you all uh, kind of join in on the discussion. This is what it's for. This is when we bring the community together to actually ask and learn together. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our excellent panel here. Uh, we'll allow each of them to say a, a word about themselves and kind of what, uh, what they love or hate about the IAC ecosystem. So. Uh, but we'll kick it off with you, Mandy. OK. Yeah, great to see everybody today. Oh my gosh. Um, so I'm Mandy Walls. I'm currently a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. Uh, I'm here, though, because I spent eight years at Chef before uh, I started PagerDuty. Woo! So been working in this space for a very long time. So excited to talk with you about what we've seen, what we've yet to see, and what we hope to see. Hello. My name is Aran Bibi. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer at Firefly. Uh, in Firefly, uh, we are helping teams to get better control over the cloud and accelerate IAC adoption. And I will be here to share some of the insights that we found in the report that we recently uh, released about the state of the IAC. So my name is Ronnie Franchi. I'm a director of engineering at NF0. And in NF0, we do... Um, we help you govern and deploy and scale your infrastructure as code, any kind of infrastructure as code at scale uh, and with confidence. And I'm really here uh, actually as one of the founding members of OpenTofu. We're here to kind of feel the pulse of the community. We've had our first OpenTofu day yesterday, which was very, very exciting. Um, and that's it. We're here to kind of hear how everybody feels. Yep. Hi, I'm Solomon. Um, I'm the co-founder of Dagger, and we do CI pipelines uh, as code. And actually, we're discovering in this conference that people are using us for all sorts of pipelines as code, not just CI, which I think is scary and also interesting. <laughs> and uh, you know, Docker before that. And uh, yeah, um, I love the trend of everything as code. So let's uh, let's turn everything into code. Yes. Uh, so yeah. So fine lineup here, quite a roster. Um, so definitely tap into them if you have any questions. Uh, but yeah, let's get started. Uh, so wow, big year in uh, the IAC space. Uh, this year was actually uh, 30 years uh, to the OG uh, CF Engine. Uh, who here has used CF Engine in their lifetime? <laughs> We've come a long way since CF Engine. Um, but also the year that the poster child Terraform changed its license and all of that, and the consequent fork. Chef uh, has moved on from the world and a few other things. Well, not really, but kind of. Um, and, and then, you know, we also have uh, Docker that's evolved over time for Open Tofu. Let's uh, unpack this uh, decade, I guess, of the IAC revolution. Kind of, for, you know, like highlight the things that to you were like the most uh, important milestones, I guess, and the things that kind of changed the game in a sense. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, I can't go back 30 years. I, I have used CF Engine, <laughs> but only painfully. And um, yeah, I think over the, the past 10 years-ish, um, starting 
post CF Engine Puppet, and then Chef came in, and we decided to have a programming language and a DSL versus a like straight up like proprietary config language, and that sort of changed things there. We also had a license split, like if you weren't in part of the Chef community at that time, um, there's still an open source fork of, of Chef called the Sync Project, and those folks are, are still pretty active. I talked to some of them last week at scale in Pasadena. Um, so, like, everything old is new again. Uh, things maybe don't repeat, but they rhyme. And um, yeah, and we see, now that I work at PagerDuty, we're sort of part of your tangential infrastructure, and we see a lot of our largest customers relying on Terraform to configure all their components, even though we're not necessarily infrastructure, but we really are infrastructure for that, so. I can share uh, a bit of what we see in the recent report that uh, the landscape is fragmented and we see a lot of people that are considering shifting between the current ISC that they are using into new uh, ISC framework. So um, notice, noticeable uh, stuff will be people considering to adopt crossplane and also moving from uh, Terraform to OpenTofu or really I think one of the challenges in that specific ecosystem of other IC is that there is a lot of tools, but the, still the community is still evolving, so it's not like uh, there is a consolidation, there is a fragmentation. And I think this is one of, one of the biggest challenges in managing cloud right now, that we, we, you have teams that are choosing the right tool, but other teams within the same organization may be taking a different approach, a different tool, a different concept, and we see that uh, being a trend in, in the industry right now. Oh. So yeah, I, I very much relate to that. I think, well, first of all, we've come a long way, right, from writing scripts which are completely stateless to managing our infrastructure and then kind of sharing those scripts uh, and recipes uh, and then evolving into a stateful uh, deployment that is uh, owned by a proprietary cloud or another and then something that evolved into much more than that with Terraform. Uh, and we see back from kind of um, uh, going back from uh, declarative code into imperative code again uh, via CDKs. So we see all, all sorts of uh, changing tides uh, coming back and forth. Uh, and we see that within teams, we see that between different companies. Um, and I think uh, I very much relate to something I've also heard you say in one of your uh, podcasts that uh, kind of uh, a thing that uh, used to be in pass before uh, Docker, which uh, kind of notion you had was you need to kind of separate the platform from the actual uh, container, right? So not kind of solve two things at once and uh, kind of focus on trying to um, be able to support the different preferences people have as to how they want to govern and manage their infrastructure. So that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, you've talked about CF Engine. That, <laughs> that was a blast from the past. Really? Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I didn't expect Docker to be relevant in this conversation, but uh, I mean, I started out, um, my starting point was being inspired by configuration management and the idea that you could sort of write down what you want your server to be, you know, describe the state that you want, and then it would just happen. And then cloud was just barely starting to happen, right? And you had CF Engine, Puppet, um, and, but Puppet was very server-centric. And I think you guys at Chef were the first to say, this DevOps cloud thing, you know, let's, let's try to build a tool that's native to that, you know? Um, and, and then, I mean, so much happened. And there's a lot of big uh, events. But, I mean, more recently, what I'm excited about is that um, I think we're sort of um, figuring out that niche custom DSLs are great to start, but at some point um, you need to go where the biggest ecosystems are. You know, the biggest ecosystem wins, and mainstream languages just have the biggest ecosystems. So you, if you can find a way to fit and connect to those ecosystems, um, everything just sort of becomes easier you know, because you're solving a problem uh, together with a larger group of people. So I mean, we went through that transition at Dagger. We started out with a DSL, and then, you know, we're forced to go to mainstream languages because people wanted to use that. So, I, yeah, I feel like now the APIs are becoming powerful enough that you can, you can, uh, you can actually do that. 
And the state part, I mean, we don't have state, so, you know, so I'm, I feel lucky in that way because state is a pain. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do the stateless pipeline, you know, pipelines and um, everyone else can figure out the really difficult state management part. <laughs> That's my strategy. <laughs> yeah. So it's good that you touched on that. Uh, you know the difference between a good question and a great question? It's a... Uh, when it's in the presentation, it's a good question, but when it's the next question, it's a great, it's a great segue. So on that note, I was actually going to ask about like kind of the trend towards uh, CDK and programming language as infrastructure as actual code and not just uh, their own domain-specific language. Do we see, does the world of cloud uh, need a specific language? I mean, we've seen historically things like uh, Darklang that tried to actually be a cloud-native programming language. Wing Cloud out of Tel Aviv is doing the same sort of thing. Uh, and I'm wondering, do we need a cloud-specific, cloud-native language to, to rule them all? Do we want to just migrate over to programming languages and forget the whole DSL format? What do you think is going to be the winner in all of this shakeup? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm say YAML. Oh, no. Please, bro. Yeah, that was on, on purpose. Um, Play and, more. And, and I will say that because um, I have a lot of PTSD about trying to teach people just enough Ruby for Chef, and and then talking to our customers who are like, "Hey, we wrote this thing to turn YAML into Terraform that then talks to our APIs and all this stuff. Can we take it from us and maintain it? Because we don't want to maintain it. Um, I think there's a certain amount of exhaustion among especially application engineers for specialized tools and the ability to the desire to abstract a lot of that stuff away from the frontline engineers is very very prominent right now especially with our largest customers i got there's a lot of shaking heads like you're probably seeing this especially if you have very very large engineering organizations no one wants to spend time across 20,000 engineers teaching everybody yet another tool and like we're seeing a lot of that pushback with our larger customers as well. Like they're just people are exhausted and they're tired of learning little bits of pieces just to address one component of their infrastructure or one component of their job. Um, so I'm encouraged by all these other meta tools and other things that are going on that um, we can pull folks back out of that and get them back into the innovation and creativity in service of the customer and not in service of addressing the infrastructure. Yep. I definitely can agree with that. I think it's really about how you are structuring uh, the responsibility within the organization, whether the actual developers are responsible for cloud infrastructure or you have a central team like the platform team or a DevOps team that is doing that for them or abstracting uh, and providing those self-service flows. So if it will be developer, definitely the developer will prefer a common language uh, but what I see right now is, again, a shift where developer is less responsible for the provisioning, and this is being abstracted for them. So the platform team really can decide whether they use YAML or they use other type of uh, language in order to, to provision. And uh, maybe this is the way uh, moving forward. And again, I agree, people don't like to learn more and more uh, languages, and there is a barrier of skills. And usually this is what is uh, being considered as the way to do in a specific account. So I, I very much relate to that. I think um, it, it really all boils down to your organizational structure, right? Who, who owns this, this piece of code and who, who should be maintaining it and what level of abstraction you want to offer. Um, we've seen all kinds of paradigm shift, right? I mean, Crossplane is one. You've mentioned YAML. I mean, whoever is using Crossplane thought it was a good idea to use that. Um, and, and it's probably because organizations who use heavily use Kubernetes are very much used to that language. And all right, that's one less thing to learn. Um, and it also can be told about Go, or TypeScript, or JavaScript, or Rust, or whatever language a CDK supports. right? Um, so in that sense, it really depends on who your target audience is. right? Um, and I think that's a good thing, that you can actually support them all and let the organization decide how they want it to be structured. right? Uh, and what level of abstractions they want to they want to offer? If they want to own more of the coding side on the developer side, or actually more of or less more of an abstraction and more of familiar tools in the DevOps world. Yeah, I, I, well, I think all that's true. I also think the 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 DevOps and infrastructure community, when it comes to ecosystems, uh, is thinking too small. 
because we're, we're so used as a community to the platform. We're not really used to real platforms anymore because if you dig through the layers of scripts in YAML, it's still Linux, you know, and Bash, I guess, you know, it's Bash on Linux and everything else is just glue around it. And that's been true since CF Engine. It hasn't really changed. Um, and, and so I think we're, gravi we're doing a great job at solving the problems that don't really need a new platform. Um, and that's the problems we're talking about, like provisioning, provisioning the cluster, provisioning the buckets, you know, some, some gluing together. But as soon as you, it becomes pipelines, of course, you know, I see pipelines everywhere now, so sorry, <laughs> it's biased, but, um, you know, provisioning the stuff in, in Terraform is kind of the easy part now. Uh, then you got to glue everything into that because you need the application to get on there. You need to build 10 different pieces and run integration tests and all that, all that glue. And sometimes you try to do, to do that glue with Terraform or whatever infrastructure tool you're using. Um, and that usually it, it only goes so far because it's not really made for that. Um, and then, or same thing for Kubernetes operators. Like you can only do so much composition of operators, you know. So I, I'm sure some people in the room disagree, but I think sometimes the answer is, well, Kubernetes is the platform. No, <laughs> it's, it's not a thing to program. I mean, you can extend Kubernetes, but um, if you want to know what a real platform is, you go ask developers, you know, like iOS is a platform, Java is a platform. Uh, we just need, we need platforms like that, it's just really hard to do. Uh, and it requires, um, like you know you got it when you can write real code in a regular language and the, you know, the API docs make sense, you know, and the SDKs make sense. It's just a really hard problem to solve. I think I credit Pulumi a lot for pushing, you know, building momentum in that direction. Um, it's just, I don't think we're there yet. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to do. But my point is simply that we have to remember that we're not there. We have to set the bar higher. Because a, a bunch of scripts gluing Terraform and 30 other tools together, uh, that's not the, like, it's not supposed to be like that. You know, we, gotta, we got some work to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, actually a good point. That's a, a good direction. I actually did want to touch a little bit more on the Terraform and OpenTOEFL, but we'll come back to that in a minute. But you touched on something. You keep bringing me back to <laughs> other things. But uh, let's talk about abstractions for the cloud. Like, I think that that's what you're getting at, and that there's so much complexity. And you talked about the complexity and the fragmentation, and that in the, the report, it just is getting worse and harder. And, and eventually, infrastructure is supposed to just you know, serve a higher order goal, right? And there shouldn't have to be so much work and complexity at just having your infrastructure run. So let's unpack that a little bit and why we're failing at the whole abstraction for the cloud part and making it a lot easier. Uh, maybe I can share that uh, as I see it, it's not just about putting infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, it, it sounds easy. You have access, you do some click ops, you have stuff, but in the real life, you need to make sure everything is in the right governance and it's not a policy violation from a security perspective or even from cost perspective. Uh, and you need to make sure that you have that blueprint so you can replicate it. So there is a real need to make sure that you have that template in place and it properly modulized the way that your organization allow to put in infrastructure and this is uh, one of the items that makes stuff more complicated. So it's not just writing a manifest and then everybody can use it. You need to make sure that manifest is whitelisted and approved and you have that pipeline that is making sure that it's okay to provision and give you the thumbs up and this is okay to go to the cloud. And to make it right and to make it consistent, you need to have a very good framework and discipline and somebody really cared that this is how stuff need to be done in your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think that's very true. I mean, configuration at the end of the day is, is it, Terraform and, and those kind of languages not, are not just about deploying infrastructure. We're seeing uh, providers for page duty and we're seeing providers for pretty much anything else. So um, yeah, the easy part is deploying infrastructure, but there's, there's more than that. There is configuration and infrastructure that you want to maintain the way you deliver it, right? You want to maintain 
a certain policy in the organization that can be different in different teams in the organization and could be exclusive to everyone. Um, so different configuration, different policies, different governance at the very organization level are very, very important beyond just infrastructure. And yes, it, it's true, at the end of the day, they want to deliver applications, but there is so much around them that really much revolves around the same paradigm, um, which I think um, is where these, these kind of um, uh, tools shine best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say too, um, vendor lock-in, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the, all the vendors have their preferences, they wanna keep you around and keep you paying their bills for them. Um, so, <laughs> pushing you to a place where your switching costs are increasing because you have invested a whole lot of resources into addressing their particular endpoints is super important for them, right? But also, like looking at that, looking at some of the APIs that are present in the industry and in the marketplace for cloud in particular, some of them are an absolute nightmare, right? And you think about APIs, they've been around forever, but as a disciplined practice and as part of the product management of the products, APIs feel very nascent, like they feel very infantile in a lot of places where product folks are just now thinking about them as sort of a first class part of the product so that you're only just now starting to get consistency and predictability and the kind of behaviors you're expecting out of those endpoints. So I feel like we're at an infancy part of this sort of like getting to better ways to address all of these complex structures um, because the product just hasn't been there. It hasn't been part of the discipline. Yeah. I sense that you have uh, input on the things that Iran ta talked about yeah, a little yeah. bit about the uh, workflows and the, yeah. Yeah, I think I, 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 you made me think about a, a few things. Like the, it, I think that is one huge uh, potential benefit of turning all of this mess into code. Um, once you have code, um, you can start open sourcing some of that code, and and then you can have a a commoditization process where some some things that you're that are black boxes proprietary services that you're paying a lot of money for usually there's a core that's really difficult to do and it makes sense to to pay someone else to do it but then you need to expand the subscription you need to add value and so you have all these additional satellite features that come with the black box you know an example that I'm familiar with, because I see it all the time, you know, is a deployment service. They host your application. That's great. But they also build for you, but maybe the build is a little extra, you know. And then you think, well, I can build my stuff, but, you know, it kind of comes together. Um, and then if, if you, can, you can implement your own build logic, but it's going to be a bunch of scripts. But if, you know, as APIs appear that allow you to express more and more of your uh, workflow and your stack as code, then from there you can say, hey, I wrote the code, who wants to use it? And uh, I think it's a natural pushback against the, the expanding black boxes. And it kind of reminds me of the early days of Linux, you know, when, I mean, Red Hat was the catalyst for this. You had a lot of proprietary Unix systems and and then Linux appeared and Red Hat sort of created the packaging ecosystem, the platform around it to say, you know what, we're gonna open source a lot of stuff that used to be very expensive now. You know, and the, the adoption of that platform, the Red Hat platform, I think now we tend to forget a lot of it was cost reduction. It was the buyers pushing back against proprietary vendors. So I think that's the opportunity now, you know, turn all of that into code and then we can start pushing back a little bit. Okay, but I'm going to bring us back to our original topic of infrastructure as code, Sorry. specifically, no, no, what's happening in this ecosystem right now, because I still think uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, first of all, I just recently read an article from Ohad Mezlish, the uh, CEO and co-founder of N0, about how he spoke about um, the Terraform binary becoming maybe the HTTP for IAC now that there are two variants in a sense and, uh, and they have become kind of the most popularly de facto adopted kind of way of configuring and provisioning infrastructure. Um, what do you think about this, about these two uh, competing and complementary in a sense almost uh, formats of running infrastructure as code and also how it's going to play out for other industry players who aren't kind of aligned with that syntax and like Pulumi and Crossplane and the others that you, and 
Yeah, so, so as I said, I, th I feel like um, there's a constant uh, shifting of the tides, right? Um, mm -hmm. We, th there was, um, there's, a, there's a great promise in, in Terraform and what it does and what it delivered. And um, we can see that. You can see that Pulumi also has support for Terraform providers. We can also see that in, even in Crossplane, right? So it, it, it kind of almost as if Terraform providers are now used in OpenTOFU, in Terraform, in Crossplane, in Pulumi. So that, that, that's, a, that's a big deal, right? That means that, um, that something in that contract role works really well for several technologies. Um, and, and you mentioned something about uh, vendor locking, which I think is very important to say, right? At the end, at the, end of the day, uh, and you also mentioned it in the sense of uh, choosing a, a, a commodity uh, programming language. Um, I, I think it, it, what the important part is you choose something that will make sure that whatever you write, you can deploy it and you can govern it and manage it, manage it and you can eject from one vendor to another. Uh, whether it be a TypeScript or something else, or um, but so long as the technology allows you to lift and shift between different offerings and different platforms, and you can deploy this code in really any way you like, in any provider or vendor or platform that allows you the best value and the best uh, value for your dollar, then yes, absolutely, that would be the one uh, I would choose. So it's interesting as, as um, we spiral around between very declarative language that starts to pick up some imperative thoughts and then back to imperative languages who, who, who start governing, then another twist around to declarative language <laughs> with YAMLs. Um, so that's fine. That's I mean, everybody has their preference. So long as you can lift and shift, uh, I think that's, that's key. Um, and yes, at the end of the day, we also see a collision between these worlds where providers are used on very different platforms. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my opinion on that. Maybe to add uh, something about specifically the dilemma between, you know, Terraform and OpenTOFU that was uh, basically OpenTOFU was split out of Terraform. I think the migration effort between IAC tools is something that always need to be considered as a significant effort. And uh, people that are now in that dilemma, whether to adopt OpenTOFU or not, as I see it, I think this is the time to make that decision. It will be easier to migrate and choose uh, the right path for you now uh, because they are uh, re relatively very similar, but moving forward when the community will take OpenTOFU into another path, I guess it will be a different type of tools. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So, so right now there is no migration path. Right, it's just a drop in replacement. Yeah, so you it, can go ahead and try it. It's relatively easy, but let's say, let's say like two years from now, four years from now, I will assume, you, you will never know, but I will assume it will be two different tools mm -hmm. and the migration, hurt. if you, you will take the time to take the decision, will be harder and more time consuming. So there is that dimension of taking action right now. This is uh, what I think, this is what I suggest for companies that are asking me about open tofu whether I should adopt, I'm just pushing them to really evaluate, evaluate that decision in, in the near time frame because it will be harder to take a decision later on. Yeah. So, so I think it's very true and like I said right now it's a very, it's simply a drop and replace and then the key part is um, you, you really get to choose. You get to choose, you get to turn back if you want to, we we'll really keep an eye on that. Um, and we want the tools to evolve right now in ways that we offer uh, additional opt-in features, right? Nothing that will ever break compatibility. And like I said, providers are used in so many different ways beyond OpenTOFU and Terraform, so you, you know you're safe there, right? Otherwise, it'd be a completely different, uh, completely different story. Um, so yeah, good point. Were you asking about declarative versus imperative at some point? <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> So, uh, you we can uh, go rogue. <laughs> no, no, by all means. <laughs> I feel like I'm asking the question for you. No, no, go ahead. I, I'm actually interested what you have to say about that. No, because the, the, at some point I, you guys were talking about choosing one model versus the other and, and the, the back and forth. Um, yeah, I think what, what, one thing we've seen is choosing imperative languages, but then not having uh, the underlying APIs to support it. In, in our world, we have Jenkins and Groovy. Mm -hmm. And so when we say, hey, we do CI as code, people say, OK, I've done that before. I know where that road leads. You know, madness. But, <laughs> but, 
but I think in that case, the problem is there is no declarative API underneath. The good example is if you write a web application in PHP or any imperative no. language, you're going to make <laughs> queries for your data in SQL, which is a declarative language. You know, so that, I think that's the right model. You know, the, the, the hybrid of an imperative language that lets you query declarative APIs, I think in the long run wins, in my opinion, because you get kind of the best of both worlds, right? So. Interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't want to go imperative or just declarative. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in like 2008. We have had that discussion so many times, but like I'm glad you still love it. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about the open tofu stuff though, because like the, when you have a fork like that, like you can't assume that whatever the corporate entity is going to do is going to stay static forever. And we've probably all seen in the news the past couple of weeks some of the tremors about what's going on with, with Hashi and what... Next question. <laughs> right? <sighs> Who knows, right? Um, if, if they get bought, if, if their structure changes or any of those kinds of things that could impact things downstream. Now, in the long term, it's better for Hashi to keep an eye on Open Tofu and see what's going on there, what's popular, see what they could pull in, what their product managers missed, that the community has taken the effort to implement themselves to say, oh yeah, this was something we probably should have looked at and pull that stuff back through. It's almost yeah. going to be like an inception, like a uh, Terraform distribution of itself. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be interesting. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, but I mean, our focus really was uh, to begin with. We keep saying four, but it's it's really to preserve the right. preserve Terraform as open source, right? Uh, and preserve people's uh, ability to to influence it, influence on it as well. Uh, we've we've very recently added um, uh, a feature that was very much a high demand one in Terraform for a while. Um, you know, secrets sitting in your state in plain text. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. Um, um, so we were able to actually push things like that forward. Or actually, not us. It's the community that actually was able to actually get behind such a pull request and push it forward. So we're very humbled by the support we've gotten. And we actually see how it can positively affect that project. And I'm sure we'll see the same of kind of affecting Terraform, right? Mm -hmm. Back and forth. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, like, that's one of those features that's like, from an enterprise software perspective, like it's something that everybody wants, but nobody wants to actually say they want to pay for. Yep. So while it takes a bunch of resources to implement it on the corporate side, like you don't have the justification for it because it doesn't add to your to your pipeline to your licenses. So like it's then you get this like proof of, of value from right directly from the community, like hey, we really want this, even though you don't want to build it for us. Yeah, and, and I think this kind of thing can only happen when the project really is owned by a foundation yeah. and not by a commercial entity. I mean. We're end of zero. We don't own this project. It's a Linux foundation who do. There are other commercial vendors behind it. There are other open source uh, vendors behind it. Um, but everybody kind of pushes there in, in a certain way. But Linux Foundation kind of enforces us to sit down as, as a committee and make sure that what's being done is done by the community and being published and be very transparent about it. So that's, that's very good. By the way, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, um, the inception, you know, HashiCorp being a distribution of itself via open tofu, maybe. Um, and maybe they could have done that themselves. Um, that, that's kind of how we all got here, with Docker being its own. Right. I mean, CNCF started out as the open tofu of Docker, right? right. We spun out run C and OCI, we spun out container D, mm -hmm. uh, and a few others. But I mean, container D turned out to be the most important. And I mean, that was a very happy transition. Container D is a very successful project. It's exactly like. Um, you know, open tofu. It, it's not the whole product; it's a component. But um, Docker, to this day, is a happy downstream distribution of Container D. You know, and it's so much better that way. You know, so it's maybe we should have done it earlier. It's a very interesting take. Interesting. From uh, from the lion's mouth. This is going to be my last question, and I'm happy to uh, see if anybody else uh, wants to chime in and ask some questions. But uh, so it's funny, kind of uh, another inception. But I listened to the IAC podcast about the IAC report, <laughs> the state of IAC report. Um, and one of the things that, one of the data points that was actually interesting to me was kind of this trend of uh, migration away from um, the, t the traditional tools, the Terraform and the cloud formations, et cetera. And then I guess the most controversial question of them all is, uh, was this a miscalculation on HashiCorp's part? And we're also hearing that the buzz of uh, maybe looking for, you know, um, 
buyer. You know, buyer and, uh, you know, moving on. I don't know. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, what are your thoughts on how this might play out and uh, right move, wrong move. It's hard to say, but I'm just wondering. It's, it's hard to say yeah. uh, right now. I think it's too soon uh, to see whether existing customers of AshiCorp will take a different path. And um, I think they uh, well considered all of the options uh, mm -hmm. by doing this move, including uh, people getting upset about uh, that specific action of them. But eventually, this is you know a corporate decision, and um, I think in one or two years from now, it will be very clear whether they did the right decision or not commercially. Again, for them, I think eventually for the community, with having Open Tofu uh, came to life, uh, it's good to the community, and is it backed by um, the Linux Foundation, so it's now free from any risk of being uh, closed uh, in the future. Uh, so right right now we have that dilemma, whether to migrate or not. It's a, it's a pain, I know, but eventually for the long term, as you mentioned, uh, features that was highly requested by the community now being accepted and implemented. So I will consider that a good news for the community and not very sure about how Ashi will yeah. The future of Asha will be on that specific topic. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I don't really have an opinion on whether it's good or bad for HashiCorp, mm -hmm. but it, it's been very helpful for me because we have an open source engine and we have a commercial strategy that involves not changing the license. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's a pain to do it. You don't have to. Red Hat didn't have to anyway. So we, we, that's our model, and I don't think we'll ever change it. I think it'll be very successful, but the one question I can't answer is, what if you change your mind later? You know, what if you get bought? What if you get fired and a new CEO comes in and, and changes the plan? I, you know, I, I can't really answer that, you know, because I can't tell you, I can't tell you the future, but now I can say, well, that's what happened with HashiCorp, and it, was, it went fine, right? It got forked, and there's a foundation, so, you know, if we do that in the future, I guess that's what will happen, so you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very helpful uh, as an answer to that what if question, you mm -hmm. know, that it played out okay, so thank you. Yeah. They chanced <laughs> it and <laughs> they put their neck out and everyone else now has a better answer about that. That's great. Uh, any questions from the, uh, from the audience for this esteemed panel of experts? <laughs> Anyone? How much time, how do we, how are we doing on time? Do we need to wrap up or? Time's up, is that a time's up sign? Do I have one more question? Yeah, okay. So bonus question. <laughs> Since uh, we can't have a panel on, a, on uh, IAC without asking about AI, the future, game changer, is it gonna change the way uh, we work? Is it going to free up engineers to do higher order things? Is it a hype cycle? Uh, Talk for, to me. for now, I think it's a very good shortcut. Again, if everything is described as code and AI can generate code, so you can uh, generate infrastructure as code, and uh, the most popular models are doing a decent job. Of course, there is always the lag between the latest and greatest, and new resources uh, that need been introduced into Terraform, for example are not uh, uh, available in the AI models, so there is a lag. However, I think it's a great shortcut, and we also see that in the report when we ask how people provisioning and creating new manifest, so AI was one of the answers, and I think this trend is going to be popular. And we also talked about the skills gaps, so I think this is another way to reduce the skill gaps. Everybody can you know, use natural language to ask for a manifest for an EKS cluster and he will get something that is, I guess, close enough mm -hmm. for uh, uh, being used. This is my thought. Yeah, I, um, so I, I see it as, as, as a catalyst, really, because at the end of the day, I mean, we've said the infrastructure as code is so great because, and I'm saying, saying this from an, an engineer perspective who kind of made some transition, I was able to see, wait, but so, of course, we, you have to have your, your, um, your changes be governed by Git, and you have to have approval flows, and you have to have this transparency, and you have to have the ability to, to roll back, and you have to have all of these things that 
are very commodity and basic in, for anyone who's coding for, for a while. And then to learn that infrastructure is not, was not managed like that for a long while was, okay, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a surprise. So um, here's another thing we can, we can basically earn now. Um, we all, all of us in the coding world, we use AI all the time as, with Copilot and, and things like that to help us out. There's obviously a great reason to use it with uh, any kind of code. We're, we're, of course, being it a commodity coding language, a programming language, uh, but not just, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. Like, especially for small and medium-sized organizations, like it's going to be the most helpful. I think when you get to scale and have a lot of engineers, you're going to get more benefit and more control and compliance and those kinds of things by maybe doubling down on an actual platform practice. If anybody wants to platform engineering day on the first day and, and, and those kinds of, of um, projects, like piling up those kinds of teams um, to go, pave the golden path for people so that you're not just downloading or predictive texting your way into infrastructure that may or may not meet your compliance and regulation needs, just making sure that everybody is following the path that they're supposed to and putting your resources there rather than hoping you're going to pull stuff off the internet that works right. Okay. Any concerns about quality? Always. Always. Yeah, always with AI, <laughs> absolutely. Like, Use are we going to wake up in five years with like tons of like garbage code and? Uh... We already have that, but we got it from Stack Overflow <laughs> instead of Copilot. So, I, Stack Overflow keyboard of copying pasting, right? <laughs> I think actually the, the so there's all of that 100% you know oh it's code oh I can generate the code wait what what is that generate code <laughs> but it's going to get better I'm sure but I think we're 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 also underestimating the, generating code is the obvious one uh, there's the counterpart also hey this uh, this DSL is terrible but ChatGPT can generate it so maybe I don't need regular code so I think for a while I was worried that you know Gen AI was going to slow down the adoption of uh, you know the switch to mainstream programming languages because it's less urgently needed. But I think actually that's, there's so many other reasons like we talked about. But separately from all that, I think one, one amazing feature of Gen AI that, that's being slept on is uh, function calls. You know, the whole agents thing. Um, for now it only works really well with GPT-4. The open models are not really caught up, but it, it, it works really well. I think everyone's going to catch up. And you don't need to generate code. You can hook up these function calls to APIs. And then you can have the LLM do things on your infrastructure without having to go through generating code. I think that will work better for a lot of the stuff we're talking about. Um, yeah, I'm sure it'll break still. But. <laughs> OK, looks like we're out of time. Lights are up. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Yeah.